Nature's Archive Podcast, a Jumpstart Nature production. It's hard to even imagine how many salmon there used to be to anybody who's been born after, you know, 1950. We can't even, we can't even fathom how many there were in, back in the day. People say there's so many you could walk across their backs. There were so many you could dance across, you could break dance across their backs. So what do parasitic plants, 600 year old oak trees, salmon and hoverflies have in common? Well, there's some of Griff's, Michelle Fulner's, and my favorite wild organisms. So today's episode is a fun conversation with Michelle, Griff, and myself, Michael, where we advocate for our 10 favorite animals and plants. We each bring three species to the conversation. Well, not physically, but virtually. And if you do the math, there's three of us times three species, and you might be wondering, well, how do we get to number 10? So we had a bit of a game to decide who got to pick the 10th species. And all I'm saying is I still think that aphids would be good at soccer, but you'll have to listen to hear what that's all about. This whole idea was Michelle Fulner's. And if you don't know Michelle, she's the host and producer of Golden State Naturalist podcast. It's a fun and entertaining California-centric nature podcast, but the lessons in it span way beyond California. Her fourth season is about to launch, and she plans to cover topics that I know you'll love, wildlife crossings, coastal wetlands, red-legged frogs, and so much more. So be sure to check out her podcast and follow her social media as well. And looking ahead, Jumpstart Nature is in the late stages of three new episodes for this fall. We're going to be talking about invasive species, outdoor cats, and there's an inspiring land conservation story that succeeded against all odds that you just have to hear about. If you're listening to this on the Nature's Archive feed, well, we have plenty of fun episodes coming too. We're covering topics from wildlife forensics to ants and much more. So, all right, here we go. So from this moment forward, no mistakes. No. Yeah. (laughs) Perfection (laughs) is what we demand here. All right. How's everybody this morning? Grand. Getting there. Yeah. Not quite at the grand level, but, but not bad either. Somewhere in between. We'll get you a crazy straw for your coffee. Put it in, in, you know, a helmet. To get gravity working in your favor. Like those beer helmets you see Mm -hmm. people sporting events with. With the straw? Yeah. You're going to be good to go. Definitely. Well, all of us, I think, have some roots in California. We've spent a lot of time kind of learning about the space, learning about the world around us here. And so I wanted to bring us together and talk about some of our favorite species. So I was going to go ahead and just kick us off. And then we'll just take turns. And then, because there's three of us, we're making a top 10 list. So let's get our top 10 favorite species, native species. And then, because there's three of us, that only brings us to nine. So we have a problem. So each of us have four favorites. And to choose which one is our number one, they're going to have to compete. And we're going to have to figure out which one is going to win in a game. And that game is yet to be determined by being drawn out of a hat. So a sport. And we'll see which of our species would win. So not a video game? Not a video, you know, I should have put professional gaming in there, but I didn't. Video gaming. I've never even really seen a video game, so okay. I, you know. <laughs> I was really hoping for some truly exotic sports like underwater polo or, you know, something oh, like that. Oh, yeah. But they didn't we'll get see. that exotic. Ah. Yeah. I mean, not just the the top most televised sports for sure, but not super exotic ones either. We'll see. We'll see what so comes my out. Aquatic beetle, my aquatic beetle may have a difficult time. I was planning on that <laughs> underwater polo. It was going to take us. It was going to take the competition away. (laughs) You're going to win us. Okay, so I'll kick us off, and then we can just kind of go through. We'll go me, Griff, Michael, until we get to to our number one spot and figure out which one's going to win. Sounds good. All right, so so number 10. This is number 10. My first one that I have here is it's a butterfly, and it is native to an area where I live. And maybe actually... I don't think Michael's in the range of it. Michael might be just south of the range of this butterfly, but it's a Northern California butterfly that I love very much. And it's beautiful blue. And it has on the underside of its wings, it has these beautiful like orange and white sort of spots. And the back is almost like this black and then iridescent blue. And the males are like more blue than the females. And it's the California pipevine swallowtail butterfly. And it is gorgeous. Like they're big, they're beautiful. They're very, like, to me, charismatic. So I just really love seeing them in the forest. And I see them a lot of times in, like, riparian areas. I see them in Auburn Mm -hmm. all the time. And when I'm in Auburn, when I'm hiking there, the other thing I see is their host plant, which is the California pipe vine, sometimes known as the Dutchman's pipe, which is the only place where little caterpillars can grow up. So it's their their food of choice, and they love living on the Dutchman's pipe. They eat it, and they do something else that's really cool. 
So I talked a little bit about their bright colors. And maybe you guys can help me pronounce this word because I'm not actually sure how to pronounce it. Is it aposematism? You guys know this word? I always say aposematism, aposematism? But, but that's just me. I, I heard somebody pronounce it the other way, but I don't actually know. Yeah, I, I don't think I've ever heard anybody pronounce it besides me and a couple other podcasts. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so my default was aposematism, and then I heard an entomologist say aposematism, and so now oh, I'm let's go with that then. Let's go. I don't know. Let's go with that. Okay. All right. We'll, gonna... we'll get our team of fact checkers to work. Out yeah. Okay, the fact Where's the all <laughs> bugs better, Kevin? We just need to ask him. <laughs> there we go. There we go. That's a great idea. So if anybody doesn't know what aposematism, we're going to go with that, is, is basically you ever see those like really bright like frogs in the rainforest with these vibrant colors? They're like poison dart frogs. Well, the bright colors, here's the thing. This, the animal has, has an issue, right? So this animal is super poisonous and it's like, I'm protecting myself by being poisonous, but that's not going to help if the bird or the, the snake or whatever animal comes and eats it and has no idea that it's a poisonous animal. So the creature has these bright colors to let everybody know, hey, I'm poisonous, don't eat me. And that's called aposematism. They're teachers. So these butterflies. What about poor dogs? I thought they were colorblind. Do they not get the scoop uh, on this or what? That's a great question. How many other animals are colorblind? We have like or amazing color real? vision. Humans have like some of the best color vision. Birds are better than us. But mm -hmm. like humans have really great color vision. But also a lot of animals that we think of as colorblind. It's not like grayscale black and white type colorblind. They have some colors. So I wonder if. You know, the important colors like yeah. the poison colors. I wonder if it's like, you know, dogs can see orange or whatever it is. I'm not sure. Had to look that up. Oh, what an interesting question. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I love that these these butterflies do this because they're just letting everybody know, hey, don't mess with me. I have these bright colors. Don't eat me. And it's because they get the toxicity from their host plant. They get it from the California pipeline. It's a super toxic plant. And the caterpillars chow down on that. And then it's like their body is imbued with this toxin. Puts so a whole cool. new spin on our you are what you eat, huh? One hundred percent, absolutely. <laughs> well, and, you, and I think you you hit an interesting point there too, because you said birds have really good vision, and mm. a lot of them can even see like into the UV spectrum, and that would be the primary predator of a butterfly would be birds. So mm. it works for them. That's a great point, and it makes me wonder if there's even colors designed for birds to see on the butterfly that we don't even see. Possibly. Oh, and you know what? Dogs and wolves, if they can't see those colors, the dose is probably, you know, dose makes a poison. Like they'd have to eat hundreds of butterflies before it made a difference. Maybe they don't need that color vision. That's a great point. Maybe it's just not even important to them. Maybe it would like knock out a bird, but it would barely touch yeah, a dog. Size matters. Yeah, for sure. Okay, that's interesting. So how to help these animals? Okay, so if you live in the native range, you got to look up a range map. It's it's Northern California. And I know it's a lot of Northern California. I don't know their exact parameters of where these butterflies live. They're in Arizona as well. I, there's a different okay. there's a different pipe vine down there. Here's the thing, though. This our subspecies is only here. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I was had to be extremely on brand for this, and I chose only endemic species. So oh, all, dang. Of, all of mine are only endemic to California. But Michael, you're right because there is. What does endemic mean for our listeners? Oh yeah, so endemic is it's only within a certain range. And so in my case, I'm choosing only organisms that are endemic to California. And this is even a little bit narrower than that because it's just Northern California. Hey, Michael here. I'm sorry to interrupt, but nature needs your help. And so do I. Jumpstart Nature, my education and conservation organization, is at a bit of a crossroads. We're still awaiting the IRS's review of our nonprofit application, and since we filled out the long form, it means it takes several months for that to happen. So we're in limbo for another few months. While we wait, we still need your financial support, perhaps more than ever, because we're taking on additional expenses to operate while we wait for the official designation. So the easiest way to support us is by becoming a patron on Patreon. And you can do that by going to jumpstartnature.com slash Patreon, spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. You can join Sarah, Mitchell, William, Erica, Jess, Maria, and Lisa, some of our newest patrons, over the last few months. And you can do this for as little as $4 a month and cancel any time. And along the way, you'll get a few perks as well. If Patreon isn't your thing... We also offer merch and a direct donate option too. Just check out the website. I hope that you can help and thanks for being part of our movement. So, so stay, staying on brand, for, for me anyway, I love to get into the nuance. So you're talking about a subspecies. So mm -hmm. there's 
pipe vine swallowtail as a species, and then there are certain subpopulations that are a little bit genetically different and have slightly different behaviors or preferences. And the one you're focusing on is the Northern California specific subspecies. Exactly. So yeah, there's a whole bunch. I know in like the the Eastern United States, and I want to say that they're more in the Southeast, but they also, I think they get up pretty far North too. I'm not sure their exact range over there, but they're not obviously the California subspecies. So yeah, those are, those are the ones that we have here. And if you live in Northern California, where these butterflies also live, a way to help them is to plant their host plant, which is the Dutchman's pipe or the California pipe vine, however you want to call it. Both are, are common names for it. But one of the things that's good to know about this plant is that everybody talks about how slow it grows. So it's a very slow growing plant, but you can accelerate it a little bit by giving it a lot of water when it's establishing. So it'll grow a little faster if you give it a good amount of water. I've had mine for, this is the third year it's been back there. I don't give it a lot of water because it's this weird spot in my side yard that I just never go over there. So it's grown really slow, but this year it like exploded. It's on this trellis. It's a vine. So it, it it's really great for the side yard, things like that, where it's like they say, plant it where the, the bottom of it will not get direct sunlight, but the leaves, it will grow into sunlight. So that's like the ideal conditions for this. It's great for taking up, you know, a wall type of space, putting it on a trellis if you've got like a small space for it. And then after a couple of years is when it really starts to flourish usually. But you can accelerate that by, you know, giving it a little extra water. It's a cool looking plant too. It is. And it's got the craziest flowers. They, it's called the pipe vine because it, the flowers look like these pipes and they're pollinated by, what are they? What are they pollinated Smokers? by? No. <laughs> they're like little gnats, right? They're pollinated yeah. by gnats, I'm pretty sure. Super crazy. That's, I re- that's, how I, that's what I remember anyways. I'm, I'm not looking it up. I think so. And then- if you open one of the flowers up, you see a bunch of dead gnats in there. So people yeah. actually thought these flowers were carnivorous for a while, but they're not. The gnats just can't always find their way out. It's just unfortunate for them. Oh, seems like someone's <laughs> got some more evolving to do. I know. Like, <laughs> let's take advantage of that situation. <laughs> All right, let's kick it over to Griff. That was my that was my first one. That was number ten. So I picked my animals based on my relationships with them. Ooh. Not those kind of relationships, but like how I've experienced them throughout my life. And so most of them stem from my childhood. So not necessarily my favorite species, but they are the species that led me into conservation. And the first one I want to talk about is turkey vultures. So I always grew up on the edge of suburbia in the Bay Area. So I was one of those kids. You'll hear a lot of older conservationists my age say this from California. I was one of those kids that pulled out the stakes when I knew they were going to build because I knew what that meant. That meant that my creek was going to get put underground. That meant my pond was going to get drained. That meant terrible things were going to happen to the animals I liked. And I had everybody in my neighborhood convinced that I could tell the turkey vultures apart. And then I had them all named. That was a lie. But everybody fell for it. And so... The one I remember the most was Big Red, and I'd watch Big Red. He was the biggest one to me, and or she, probably she. But Big Red would circle around, and I just loved turkey vultures. And I always thought they were circling around because there was something dead in the field across the street. So I always went over there and looked. And then later I found out that's not true. Turkey vultures have a great sense of smell, but they won't give up a meal. So when they're circling, they're actually rising on a warm air current that is spiral. Like so many other things in nature, it's a spiral viral just so interesting and then so i'd watch these and they had that wobbly flight like they're hitting turbulence all the time but they barely ever flapped super cool to watch and so i'd make up stories about them blah 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 and so i finally became i finally got my wildlife career started when i was 12 like on my birthday and i volunteered at the susun wildlife care center and one of the first animals that i had to go get to be weighed was a turkey vulture so the, uh, yeah. the older volunteer was like send the tw- this is the 80s this would never happen today so 12 if there's a 12 year old listening and getting excited you won't be able to do this nowadays this is the 80s so they're like 12 year old go get the turkey vulture out of the pen and bring it in here these are large so birds I, they're large birds i'm 12 i knew to put a towel over its head because when birds can't see they get less stressed so if you ever have to rescue a bird, cover it with a cloth or something. So I went in there and I went to go throw the towel over it and I missed and the turkey vulture vomited and moved, oh. its, moved its head and spread vomit everywhere. And at that moment, I knew that this was my very favorite bird <laughs> because I was 12 and I loved gross and that was the grossest thing I'd ever seen. So I ran back inside and I was like, oh my God, it threw up all over me. And the volunteer was like, oh, that's right. They do that. So I went back out there. I got it. And I've been in love with vultures and wildlife care volunteers ever since. So that was one of the things that was really cool and gross. The other thing is they pee depending on how you want to say it, <laughs> on their legs when when it gets really hot. Mm. So 
birds don't really have poo and pee so much. Like, you know, when you see bird poop, you see the brown part, the white part, and the white part. Mm-hmm. Just kind of like the pee. So they poop on their legs to keep cool, which I thought was amazing. But also because they have such strong stomach acids and might also kill the bacteria on their legs, which I also thought was super fascinating. Oh. So I, I had heard super... it also helped with like the reflectivity on their legs too. So it cools it off in the moment and then it keeps it a little more reflect. Nice little you know, whitewash. Yeah. Like the albedo oh, yeah. is higher than, mm. you know, Interesting. Yeah. I can see how that would be, especially with the white and the sh- puke or whatever. And then also they're bald. Who can't love that? And they're not bald just because that looks cool. That actually has like scientists believe in evolutionary function. So they're not getting all the dead stuff on their, their head. And like stuck I, in there's their some feathers. really cool Native American yeah. stories about how turkey vultures lost their feathers. So if you want to look that up mm-hmm. at your local tribe's website, they might have a story, especially if you live in Turkey. Well, there's turkey vultures and black vultures, but I'm sure the stories are pretty similar so i love them and they have a sense of smell which is really unusual for birds to have a strong sense of smell so their sense of smell is even better than ours so when you see turkey vultures dive and kind of cruise close to the ground they're going and they're smelling for dead things when they do that and that is also super fascinating so i just think that they're the coolest most disgusting birds and so if you have like a 12 year old who likes gross things and you're trying to hook them in conservation turkey vultures And turkey vultures also are really closely tied to the land, like all animals are, but like tied to what we're doing on the land, our Mm -hmm. management, like lots of animals. But we can fix the turkey, like how turkey vultures are affected way easier than we can fix some of the other unhealthy relationships. And one of the best things you can do for turkey vultures is if you're a hunter, switch to copper bullets. Stop using lead bullets altogether. So getting the lead out of hunting should be priority for all hunters. And I really like what like the Yurok tribe has done here locally is they have a hunters of stewards program because gut piles can help California condors, which Mm -hmm. are turkey vultures, big cousin. And so getting the lead out could actually assist condor reestablishment in California. It could actually help scavenging birds like turkey vultures. And I think these are super easy for hunters to do. And so if you have, if you know, a hunter is really poor and can't afford anything, but lead bullets, maybe and you can get some copper bullets and trade them and take their lead bullets away and say, here, you can have these instead. So those are just some of the reasons why I love turkey vultures. Also, the other really cool thing about new world vultures is they're not related to old world vultures, even though they look so similar. It's another fascinating example of convergent evolution where two things in different parts of the world can evolve for the same circumstances. And so uh, vultures in the new world are more closely related to seabirds, and that's why they have such a great sense of smell. And then the ones in the old world, quote unquote, old world, are more closely related to raptors, which is how oftentimes when you hear, when you see like raptors in North America and you see turkey vultures on there and I'm always like, what are they doing on there? But that's why is because it's a carryover from that old world tradition and accuracy because they are raptors over there. OK, that's super interesting. And when you were talking about the turkey vultures, super great sense of smell, it reminded me about something super crazy about turkey vultures which is that they don't have a septum. So like mm-hmm. that that little bit of of nostril, you know, like between your nostrils, the little bit of flesh right there, turkey vultures don't have that. And the reason why is because of that great sense of smell. So when they fly oh. around, they're getting air oh. passively passing through their nose so that they don't actually have to sniff all the time. They can actually just have the air pass through and they can pick up this insanely small like parts per million amount of an odor of something. Oh, which is how they find, yeah. And so when they're, I, I would imagine they're passively smelling just all the time, right? Because they don't have the septum. So when they're circling, they're they're riding that air current and they're not even thinking about it. Like the air's just passing through. So if something was around, they would pick it up. Interesting. Another little interesting factoid about them is they don't have a song. They don't have a call. They have yeah. a hiss. That's all oh. they do is hiss. So if you wanted to like occupy some children for a long time, tell them you give them $100, they go and hear a turkey vulture call (laughs) and they'll be outside for hours. Oh, wait, this is the 80s. I guess we don't do that anymore, right? (laughs) We need to bring that back. No, kids, stay outside for all day (laughs) long. That's what my parents. Yeah, turkey vultures are awesome. They're rad. They're super rad. Okay, Michael, let's hear yours. What's your number eight, Michael? So you both picked like really charismatic, kind of easy to see species like turkey vultures. You can see. The pipeline is swallowtail. It's a big butterfly and it's always flitting around and it's colorful. I'm going to go in the other direction Mm -hmm. and pick something that's kind of ubiquitous, but easily overlooked. And I think that when we think of pollinators, we often think of bees and they get all of the press when it comes to pollination or most of the press. But my species 
it's actually a group of species, and I'll, I'll talk about one in particular. It's the hoverfly. So some people know them as surfid flies or flower flies, and I think they're overlooked because they're small, but they're really colorful, and they look like bees or wasps, and a lot of people will even call them sweat bees. So they'll be patterned yellow and black, and you'll see them kind of hovering around your flowers. And everywhere I've gone in the United States, I've found hoverflies and usually multiple species, even in your backyard garden. So they're really efficient pollinators. They're very important. And in fact, they are not just pollinators, but the larval form when they're little babies, they actually, a lot of them will eat aphids and they'll eat other pests too, that mm -hmm. at least what gardeners think of as pests. Mm -hmm. So they play a super important role in the ecosystem. And it's not just that they eat the, the aphids or thrips or other things, but some hoverflies actually aid in composting mm -hmm. and decomposition and other things. In fact, a lot of sewage treatment plants use hoverfly larvae to help <laughs> with the what? breakdown of no sewage. No way. Yeah, there are certain species that that's, that's what they do. So yeah, I find them fascinating because I missed them my whole life, you know, until, I don't know, four or five years ago. And I, I finally started paying attention and looking closely. Most of these flies, they're pretty small. You know, if you take your average European honeybee, they're going to be maybe one third to one fifth the size of that or smaller in some mm. cases. But the really cool thing is you can identify to species most of the hoverflies because they all have a unique pattern even though they kind of mimic wasps and bees, there'll be like this intricate little calligraphy on their abdomen. And that pattern can help you identify them. Mm -hmm. And I said, I would tell you about a specific hoverfly that I you know, like more than others. And there's a genus that are actually called calligraphers. What? And it's like some little artist was drawing this special calligraphy on oh, the back. So, yeah. And they're yellow and black? Yellow and black, yeah. Okay. I have some that are... If they're yellow and black, I haven't seen it yet. Like they're really, really small and it's often gray here because I'm mm. right on the coast. But that's the main insect I see flying around our fringe cups, one of our native plants here. And I always tell people like, bees are cool because they pollinate, but hoverflies can pollinate and they're predators. Mm -hmm. you know, they're like twice as cool. Pulling double <laughs> right. duty. I mean, there are some that are not yellow and black. I'm, I'm thinking of one called a grass skimmer that's black and red. You know, and, and sometimes they have this really shiny gold on this special part on their on their back. I have a photo, I'll have to include it in the show notes maybe, that I call it a self-portrait. So even though it's this tiny little hoverfly, I had my macro lens and I got really close to it. And you can actually see the reflection of me in this shiny gold part of the fly, Ooh, which is cool. super cool. Oh, that's a really great shot. That's cool. So how can you help? How can you help these you know, wonderful pollinators? Just leave They're... untreated sewage around for Yes. Them? That's, that's what I was going to say. It'll save you on your water bill. But maybe something more practical than that is just, I, I like to say, leave those aphids alone. So aphids are, are also super cool, but a lot of gardeners, when they see aphids at the first sight of an aphid, they will get out the pesticide or spray them off with water or whatever. But what I found personally is it's so much fun to leave them because usually, not all the time, but usually the aphids will get taken care of by other predators like hoverfly larvae or lady beetles or some of the other ones that take care of it. So it inspires a song like, hey, gardeners, leave those aphids alone. Mm, mm, mm. There you go. Also mm, way better mm. than the raw sewage idea. So I'll grant you that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and just to give a little more context, I mentioned some other like, garden pests, but they'll, you know, they'll eat mealy bugs and scale mm. insects and things like that, that a lot of gardeners just like cringe when they mm -hmm. hear it. So yeah, those natural services from the hoverflies. All right. I love it. I love it. Okay. So next one is back to me. And this is number seven. And this is one of the most deadly animals in the world this is my number seven. And I actually had one of these when I was a kid. My brother and I caught it and we kept it outside of our, our home until physics did it in. And so this animal's name was Newton. And mm -hmm. it's another California endemic. And this is an animal with an incredible sense of direction. And it can, if you if you drop it just about anywhere, it'll know exactly which direction it needs to go to uh, reproduce, right? To find its natal waters because they always go back to the same places to reproduce. And oh. also it's a creature that lives a double life. So if you think about the word amphibian, amphi mm -hmm. means double and bios means life. So amphibians lead a double life. And this animal is the California newt. 
And it is found in California only exclusively. There are a couple of other species that are really closely related. There's like a rough skinned newt that looks super similar to California newts. There's like a That's Sierra newt. That's what we newt. have in our area. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You have those guys. So we had Clear. California newts growing up. And I love and adore them. I had no idea how ta- toxic they were when I was a kid. But their Neither skin <laughs> is, yeah, is like imbued with its tetrodotoxin. And it can kill you super quickly. So there's this this story. I don't know if this is a true story, if this is an urban legend, about these two guys had gone out camping. And one of them went out to the stream, scooped up some water, made some coffee, drank the, the coffee, and, and died. Um, um, um. They were trying to figure out what happened to this guy. Well, at the end, at the bottom of that pot of water, they found a dead California newt. And so they had cooked this newt and ingested the tetrodotoxin from the newt's skin, and it killed the guy, which to me is the perfect alibi, right? You're like, oh, my friend scooped up the water. Like, I think it was definitely murder. Um, For sure. This seems extremely shady to me, but that is the legend. And it would kill you. Like, there's definitely enough toxin in one of these newts to kill a full-grown human being. So... I've touched them many, many times. Turns out that's not actually great like for the newt because we can spread all kinds of little terrible things with our skin and they have super thin, yeah. breathable breathable skin as amphibians. And so it's not great for us to touch them. I actually now carry nitrile gloves everywhere I go just in case I find a newt and I want to pick it up. <laughs> so that's my kind of nerdy thing that I have with me at all times. And that's another example of? Oh, yeah. Apom- they're another. Yeah. Aposematism. Mm-hmm. Because California News, thank you, I didn't get in the description. So they're like sort of brown on top, sort of a warm brown. And they have these bright orange bellies, super mm-hmm. bright. And they have the and I actually like, picked one ears. one time walking down a trail mm-hmm. and I saw it tumble. And when it landed, it landed on all fours. Mm-hmm. But it arched its back up to make sure I saw all of its orange. Oh, I did that behavior for you. I forget what that's called. There's a name for that behavior. It's called You Better Not. Yeah. <laughs> stay, stay back. Called. It's like all the stay, stay backism. So another <laughs> little fun fact about these guys is that, you know, they they have some interesting behaviors when it comes to reproduction. They do something called a mating ball. And so there'll be mm-hmm. like a female and like four males or more just all trying to get in there and make the magic happen. So that is called a mating ball. And I've seen it happen in ponds and things where there's like just this it's a newt ball and you see a ball of newts and it's like writhing around in the water. And that's what's going on there. So if you ever see that, it's called a, a, a newt ball don't break it up don't be like relax don't break up the party no they're they're doing fine in there hopefully but it's not our business if they're not and then the way to help these creatures because like i said earlier they have an incredible sense of direction and these are animals that can live like 20 years nobody thinks that newts live that long because they're just small and you don't think about that but they live forever and they have this amazing sense of direction and they just take their same routes that they've always taken back to where they want to reproduce but a lot of times humans have put roads in the way of where they want to go. And so newts will just plod across roads. They don't stop and check for traffic. They just walk right across. And so there's actually groups of people that are like newt brigades that will go out and they'll actually pick up the newts from one side of the road and ferry them across in the same direction they're going. Love them, right? Mm -hmm. So if you want to help newts, check in your area to see if there's a newt brigade because there are, so there's some in like Sonoma County. I know there's different ones around the state. So check around and see if there's a newt brigade. Because That's there's awesome. probably a lot of different newt species that need that kind of help too. Yeah, my friend Marav leads up this group called Newt Patrol over by Lexington Reservoir here nice. in the Bay Area. And it was an overlooked roadkill hotspot <laughs> until they started documenting this on iNaturalist, by the way. Mm-hmm. And as a result now, several of the agencies that are responsible for the neighboring lands are actually working to create safe crossings for newts, which is a huge win. It's not done yet, but it's on the right path. I love that. I have a that. question for you, though. Oh. You said that your newt was named Newton, and mm. it was done in by physics. Oh, so was it like yeah. an apple fell on its head, or, or what happened? So kind of. I mean, so what happened I is, didn't know if that was a pun, or, you know, I'm thinking it, of it I, was. Isaac Newton. It, yeah. So we named it Newton unironically. Like, we just named it Newton mm-hmm. because it was a newt, mm-hmm. and we didn't know how to take care of a newt. So we just kept it in a five-gallon bucket with water, and we had, like, a stack of rocks in there so that if Newton wanted to climb out and get on the rock— he or she could. And one day, the one of the rocks fell and pinned New- Newton down. Mm. Yeah. And so Don't Newton know. died. Yeah. Underwater. Oh, it, was, it was bad. I was like seven or eight, you know, was not taking oh, good care traumatizing. of it. Traumatizing. It was sad. It was really sad. Poor Newton. Yeah. It's funny how all the naturalists brought home little animals to die when they were in their childhood. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
I did too. <laughs> Things came to my house and died. It was awful. I feel so bad. There's some now, fatalities. I think I, I think yeah. I paid my... Are you going to talk about the way that they got so poisonous? Oh, is this the is this the garter snake arms race? Yeah. Is that what you're talking about? Okay. Yeah. So I had, I, had I mean, it might be too long. It. I mean, it's so interesting. We'll talk about it. You talk about it because I only know I have a guess about what's going on there, but I think that you. It's, would it's an example of one of the arms races that I've I've learned, and, and I love researchers who dig up these stories because mm-hmm. they are the most fascinating. So whoever dug up this one, thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't know who they are, but apparently the last time I read about it, it started in the Bay Area, and the I think it's the terrestrial or no the aquatic one of the one of the garter snakes eats the rough skin newt or you know that group of newts and so as the newt you know became more and more poisonous with this tetrodotoxin which is the same toxin as in pufferfish and then the garter snake would get more and more resistant and so the and so over evolutionary time then the the newt got more and more and more toxic but the garter snake got more and more and more resistant and so what's happened is in some places the farther we away from you get you get away from the bay area sometimes the less toxic the the rough skin newts mm. get. And I found out this whole thing because I thought they were poisonous. I heard the coffee story years and years ago. Mm. And then I saw with my own eyes a black crown knot heron eat a rough skin newt. Mm. And I was like, it's going to die. Let's watch. And I sat there for hours <laughs> and it never died. And so I found out that there is a geography to this toxin and I didn't this. Know that. Yeah, it's super interesting. And then the snakes that are the most resistant, allegedly, and I read this once or twice. We maybe need to double check with another. Who's that snake person you just interviewed, Michael? Emily. Oh, Emily Taylor. Snake Emily Mama. Taylor. I mean, we didn't ask Emily Taylor. Mm-hmm. But it's like the garter snake keeps getting more and more bright. The more resistant it is against the toxic, it, it's bright. So I've seen some that look like slithering jewels. <laughs> and I've been like, you are the selected, the special. Well, well, do they become toxic too? That's the uh, hypothesis. Oh. So I don't know if that's been studied. Oh. I read about this years ago. Maybe there's more on it now. That's amazing. I didn't know mm-hmm. that. Okay, cool. All right, let's jump to Griff. Let's go back to you because now it's number six. It's your turn. Okay, so... I was a Ranger Rick kid, and whenever I saw something really cool in Ranger Rick, I had to have it or I had to go find it. So there was an article on box turtles. So my mom said if I save $10 that I could go to and buy a box turtle at the pet store. So I, like, did little work around the, you know, neighborhood, raked leaves or whatever, got my 10 bucks, went and bought my Myrtle the Turtle. And Myrtle the Turtle became my best friend for a very long time. It was a eastern box turtle. So there's four species in North America, but the common box turtle has like four subspecies. And I think Eastern box turtle is one of them, if I'm remembering correctly. So I brought her home. She was the coolest box turtle. And I just let her hang out in the backyard and I would catch her eating all sorts of things. One time I caught her with a mouse leg in her mouth. <gasps> Seriously, that was the cool. I was like nine or 10 at the time. <laughs> I thought that was the coolest thing ever. So I, so we moved a lot, but whenever we moved into a yard, there would be turtle habitat immediately built, which usually consisted of like a water source and some rocks, places for her to hide and stuff. Everything I read about in Ranger Rick. But then as I got older, I wanted a, a real pond and more turtles and more stuff. So I told all the kids in my neighborhood, if they helped me dig it in the small backyard, that they got to name something that went back there. And so next thing you know, I had waterfall and piles, of rocks, a great turtle habitat. And so people would donate turtles to me box turtles and and then i even stole one one time from these people in my church sorry walls yeah i'm the one that stole corky I, i'm admitting it now 40 years later or 40 some years later corky was kept in a box in a room and her scales were coming off and her yes. her shell was malformed mm-hmm. and so i stole her and and i took her home and her shell hardened up after Yay. a year or two and then she had babies with tank and another turtle that got donated to me because i was like the box turtle rehab place now so it was i loved those turtles they were so cool they're not native to california they're native to mostly the east coast you know depending on what species and when i went back east and saw them the wild i couldn't believe that these were wild animals because Mm -hmm. to me they were always pets then they face a lot of the same problems that the newts do they're being taken in the pet trade and i know that's a problem because i used to take rough skin (laughs) newts home all the time Mm -hmm. when i was a kid and so they're being taken. And the thing about it is, is they want to go home so bad they have another homing. So they're looking for their home. So if you take them far states away, when they get out, they're going to be looking to go home. It's just mm-hmm. an awful thing to do to anything, to take it away from its home. So the other thing that's really happening to box turtles is the roadways. So same thing with the newts. It's the roadways that are killing them. Mm-hmm. And in some places where their numbers are starting to come back after the pet trade, they're now being smashed on the roads. 
And so roadways are really something that we have to address. And Ben Goldfarb's book, Crossing, has a whole section on roads, which is super amazing, hardcore, and really, oh, look, there it is. Oh, she, I have she it. Was, I just, just produced it. <laughs> yeah. So that's box turtles. I love them. Please don't get them as pets. If you want a pet turtle in California or anywhere, go find an invasive species in your local lake or stream or mm-hmm. and take it home and make sure it can't escape. I just found take- one the other day. It was massive. It was a red ear, red, red, what's red it called? Slider. Red eared slider. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm going to have to go capture, capture some out of my local Creek and, and bring them home and make them pets because that's what they were to begin with. They're pets that people mm-hmm. let go. Like around here, a lot of the bullfrogs and the turtles that are, are invasive are released pets. But anyways, box turtles. I love them. Leave them where they're at and please drive slow during the spring and fall. Cause during the winter they're hibernating and during the hottest part of the summer, they're like kind of like estivating or summer hibernating. Mm-hmm. So it's the spring and fall. You got to be careful on the road. Okay, great. All right. Let's jump to Michael. Well, I'm going to have to change things up again a little bit because we've only been talking about animals so far. Oh, okay. Uh, mm-hmm. So I'm going to go in a different direction. And this this organism, I saw for the first time in real life just a couple of years ago. And this was after seeing these beautiful pictures of this weird looking bright red plant that peeks its way out of mm. snowdrifts. I know. And what yeah, you know what it is because it's a mm-hmm. snow plant. And if you've ever seen a picture of this, it, you, you can't forget it really because it's blood yeah. red and it does grow where there's still snow on the ground. Yeah. And, you know, so how is this possible? What is this thing that can grow when there's snow on the ground? Well, what it is, is it's actually a parasitic plant. And the reason that it's able to grow so early in the season is because it's tapping in to a nutrient system underground that other plants have developed. In fact, it's not just other plants, but the mycorrhizal fungi that connect those plants together. So this this plant, it's bright red because A, it doesn't photosynthesize, it doesn't need to because B, it's a parasite. Um, <laughs> it was and, like, it's and, not easy being green. I'm going to be red. Yeah. Right. And it actually flowers too. Like a lot of these parasitic plants, there's so many different parasitic plants out there that I also think occasionally get overlooked, but they will still flower and they will still service hummingbirds and pollinators and insects mm. and you know other things that want the nectar or want the pollen. So they're very cool from that standpoint. So the way it works, I just want to elaborate a little bit because as a parasite, I think a lot of us, when they hear that word, you kind of get this negative connotation. You think of things like ticks or fleas or roundworm or you know things like that that we don't like. But I would challenge people to maybe try to grow a different perspective on what it means to be a parasite. And it's just a different lifestyle that has evolved or has occurred, depending on how you look at the world. It's, you know, or created, you know, for that matter. And if you were to adopt the perspective of the parasite and think about what would they think of us? You know, we, we look at them and they're like, oh, they're freeloaders. They're, you know, they're, you know, doing these things without the work. You know, they may look at us and be like, you all are so frantic and wasteful. Yet, you know, we've learned to live a life that values patience and efficiency and, you know, the art of doing more with less. So these plants do more with less by tapping into the mycorrhizal fungi that are there trading nutrients, providing nutrients for the plants in the community that they're, that they're in. And they've developed this kind of relationship with this other relationship. So it just shows me like all of this interconnectedness. I'm, I'm struggling to find the right word here because it just blows my mind every time because you have, you have the, the fungi that are connecting the plants together and helping get nutrients to the plants. And then you have this parasitic plant that's coming in and tapping into that and providing its own services and its own beauty, you know, out to the world. Have you guys ever seen a parasitic plant, in anybody's native plant garden? Oh no. That would be really been- hard. That would be hard. That would be like a, a multi-year like a project probably, right? Higher you'd have to like level establish a really cool, you'd have to get these really great mycorrhizal networks going on first for, yeah. for the yeah. heterotrophs. Well, not if you use daughter. Maybe if you use the, that orange oh, string looking yeah. plant that is that that bites into things like a vampire, that'd be kind of cool plant to add to your native plant garden. Yeah. Fathers be good to your daughters, as John Mayer would say. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm so tempted to go off on daughter right now too, because daughter is so amazing. It's recently been shown that it can kind of like see in a way when yeah. it first sprouts, it just has a day or two to find a host. And there's videos, there's time evaluate. lapse videos of it. Yes. It can yeah. evaluate what's nearby and what the best choice is for it to go grow towards. 
Oh and there's so God. many amazing, you know, parasitic plants. Like mistletoe is is a hemiparasitic plant. It's part mm -hmm. of parasite. Yeah. It does photosynthesize, but it's important for wax wings and bluebirds and so many other species. And the uh, kites uh, nest in it. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's how to help. You know, don't just assume that if something is parasitic that it's harmful or negative for the environment. They're part of the the food web. They're part of the ecosystem and provide many other services to many other plants, mm -hmm. animals, and insects. And if you have an awesome parasitic plant growing in your native plant garden, it's obvious that it's in a garden, send it to us and we will post it on our Facebook pages. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> i give you a shout out. That's so cool. <laughs> well, and actually also, it's really funny that you chose that plant because just literally two or three days ago, I posted in my Instagram story because I want to make a video about these this family of plants. It's called mycoheterotrophs, or maybe not family. I don't know mm -hmm. how related they are to each other, but yeah, yeah. mycoheterotrophs. So so myco being mushrooms or the, the mycorrhizal networks, right? That are, mm -hmm. we think of as mushrooms, all of those are just the fruiting bodies. And then heterotroph, meaning that they have to eat other things, right? Like autotrophs feed themselves, heterotrophs eat other things. We're heterotrophs. Sometimes I resent that because I want to just lay in the sun and like, then just have energy. And that's not the way mm -hmm. it works. But but anyways, these cool plants that are plants and not fungi, even though they look like fungi a lot of times because they have these weird colors and they pop out of the ground in these weird ways. I don't have any pictures of them. So I'm actually crowdsourcing a reel right now because I want to make a video about them because I think they're super interesting. And so I put it in my Instagram story. I'm like, hey, plant nerds, like if anyone has any mycoheterotroph photos, send them to me. I took a picture of one last week. I'll send it to you. Oh, sweet. It was, it was interesting because the forester from Redwood Rising, Lathrop Leonard, was like, oh, and sometimes there's ghost pipes and coral root up here. Yes. Keep your eyes open. And I was like, there it is. And it was one just coming out of the ground. It's all nice. like pink, red. And it's like just barely coming out of the ground. So I'll send that one to you. Sweet. Because most people sent snow plants because that's what I talked about. But some people sent like some ghost pipes that were very cool. I have a few cool. I could send you. Oh, that'd be rad. Thank you. Okay. Who are we on? Is it my turn again? It's my turn again. So number four, also not an animal, not as mysterious or unknown as Michael's, not animal, but this one is a keystone species. So it is not a parasite, although I am acknowledging that parasites can be extremely ecologically beneficial. Lots of, lots of good that they're doing in the world. But this one is actually a host species for just a myriad, a myriad of other species. And it plays a really crucial role where it is native. And so in particular, there's a whole family of these beings. But the one that I particularly love is the valley oak. So I adore these plants. They are like, they can grow to be like 100 feet tall. I think they're our most majestic oaks. They're the biggest oaks in California. Maybe the biggest oaks, period. I'm not sure about that. They're definitely the biggest oaks in California, the tallest. And in some cases, they can live like 600 years. So these are ancient, majestic, like wonderful trees. And they're not as old as, you know, the redwoods or the sequoias, but they're they're very old. And then there is that one community. It's not valley oaks, but there's some kind of like oak situation. Michael or maybe Griff, maybe you guys know about this. What's that ancient oak that is like re-sprouting from the roots, I want to say? It's not like a single stem that's super old, but it's thought to be like the oldest organism. It's it's not a bristlecone pine, like it's an oak. You guys know what I'm talking about? I'm gonna in find Southern out. Southern California? Is it in Southern California? I want to say it's Central Coast somewhere, but I, I can do be remember wrong. reading about something Maybe that's Southern coppicing. California. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's coppicing over and over again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyways, okay, that's an oak. This is a different oak, but valley oaks are the ones with the alligator skin bark. They've got very like furrowed bark, really rough looking. They've got the gnarly long limbs. And sometimes when they start to get older, they'll send them down to like the ground and like have you can just walk up a limb. They're really beautiful. They have the really lobed leaves. And I think that they're really mysterious and gorgeous and majestic trees. But in addition to that, they're hosting hundreds of species of insects, which is super important because we're having large insect die-offs globally. We're having a lot of problems with insect populations, not universally. Some insects are faring okay, but they're not always the ones that we want to be faring okay. So oaks are really great because they bring in that biodiversity because they support so many different species of insects. And then there's a lot of birds and things that use those to raise their young. So birds need tons of caterpillars to raise their baby birdies. And so they get those from the oak trees a lot of times. So you get actually more bird diversity. If you have the same kind of density of canopy in an area, this was a study done in Sacramento, actually, you can have the same density of canopy in urban trees. And if there are oaks present, there are like seven more species of birds present. So regardless of like 
how much tree cover there is. It's the presence of oaks that's making the difference. And if you live in an area that's, that has sudden oak death and it's killing oaks, you can plant valley oaks because they don't get sudden oak death. That is a great point. Yes. But one thing that they do have a problem with is the Mediterranean oak borer beetles. Mm. And so those were found in St. Helena in like 2017, something like that. Mm. And they've been spreading. Oh, so wow. it's a beetle species. Yeah. Yeah where they're they're boring and they kill the oaks. And that's a really huge problem because the oaks are, you know, these food sources. Keystone species. Yeah, keystone yeah. species. So so anyways, it's a huge problem. There's also other species of beetles that affect other oaks, like the gold-spotted oak borer. That's more in SoCal, I think, that's in the black oaks, the coast live oaks, and the canyon live oaks. But in the valley oaks, they've started to see these Mediterranean oak borer beetles. And one of the ways to help trees in general, specifically the valley oaks, because I love them with all my heart, they're probably my favorite species, period, is to not move firewood around. Like if you are going yeah. camping, buy your firewood right there where you're going camping. Don't bring yeah. your firewood with you because these little beetles hitchhike on the logs and then they get into a new area. They escape from the logs. They don't get burned up in the fire. <laughs> Maybe some of them do, but some of them escape into the neighboring trees and they can cause massive infestations. So especially if a forest is stressed at all, it's going to be extra susceptible, but also if it's just this non-native species that maybe the tree doesn't have a natural defense to, I'm making that part up, but I'm guessing that that would also make it more susceptible. So those are that's one key thing that you can do that helps a lot of different tree species, not just oaks, not just valley oaks, is just don't move firewood. What about the woodpecker brigade, an army of woodpeckers just yeah. everywhere, you know? Bring them in. Bring them in. I like it. So that was number four. We got Griff with number three. Number three. So the, of all animals... Of all animals in California, or all animals, period, that I've had a relationship with, it's it's a genus. It's the salmon. Actually, it's the coho salmon the most. So I grew up fishing for salmon with my grandfather, and then I started doing salmon habitat restoration when I was 18 in the California Conservation Corps, and then went on to the Forest Service where I did fishery surveys, mostly for salmon, but all fish, but most it got to be mostly salmon because those are the ones that were like the most in politics and important to indigenous folks because a lot of the indigenous folks in my area, the Yurok and the Wiat and the Talawa and more Hoopa consider themselves like acorn salmon people. So salmon was like central to their culture. It's a cultural keystone species for a lot of people. And which is cool is I'm Irish and we also called ourselves in Southern Ireland, acorn salmon people because mm -hmm. we were also eating acorn and, and salmon. So my relationship hasn't just been you know, doing biological surveys on them and doing restoration. Also, I wanted to be a commercial fisherman for salmon because so many men in my family had done that. And it was important to me in my 20s to continue that for some reason. So I went up to Alaska and I worked on a fishing boat and caught tons and tons of salmon. And I really understand the relationship between them as not just an important ecological species, an important cultural keystone species, ec economic species. It's they're really part of our identity in California, salmon are, and, and have been for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years since time immemorial. And we've had commercial fishery shutdowns here in California. And I think that that really speaks to how we're doing stewarding. Like salmon are a good indicator of how we are doing as stewards. And the fact that we're losing them is not a good sign. And so many people are trying to bring them back. So many folks are, are working on bringing the salmon back. And there's lots of ways you can do that. So I won't get into all of them. But salmon have a lot of interesting, like so many interesting stories. And I would highly recommend looking up the indigenous people's stories about salmon and the communication networks they had about salmon. Like there would be several tribes along a river and they would wait till a shaman or elder at the most upriver, the most upriver destination of, of the salmon would, it would give a blessing. And then that's how the tribes downriver, and they would all agree to then start fishing. And these were mm. people of different languages and different religions and different cultures. This wasn't like, this wasn't like a monolith or monoculture. All these people were different and they cooperated around the salmon. So there's a lot of stories like that with salmon. And I think that the day that we bring back salmon and salmon are off the list and we have uh, a, a salmon fisheries reestablished and we have trees that are getting marine nutrients from the wildlife dragging these salmon carcasses because salmon die after they spawn. You know what I mean? Life's a virgin and then you die. That's, that's what I think about with salmon. Like they, it's, you know, 
they meet the love of their life, if you will, and then they die shortly after. But their bodies would get drug into the forest. And so we still see these marine markers from salmon up in these trees that are far away from the water. And that's because there used to be so many salmon. It's hard to even imagine how many salmon there used to be to anybody who's been born after, you know, 1950. We can't even we can't even fathom how many there were back in the day. People say there's so many you could walk across their backs. There were so many you could dance across, you could break dance across their backs. There was tons and tons. I've seen it in Alaska, the way it used to look down here. And I hope one day that we can bring that back. So one thing people can do right now is this is going to sound counterintuitive, but is not buying farm-raised salmon, making sure your salmon are wild caught, not eating salmon right now. I mean, even at the Yurok Salmon Festival, this is going to be the second year in a row where they haven't had salmon at this mm. Yurok Salmon Festival. Maybe switching to another fish for a while. Also knowing that everything ends up in the water. So whatever toxins you're using around your waterway are ending up in there and they're affecting the fish. So there's a bunch of little things you can do. There's a lot of different websites and stuff like that where you can learn how to help salmon. But coho salmon are different from a lot of the other salmon in California because their babies stay in the creeks all summer long, which is unusual. Mm. So when you see baby salmon with the black par marks, those like vertical marks down their bodies, when you see those in the summer, those are probably coho. And that's why they're the most endangered is because they're left with us during the summer and the droughts and the water diversions, especially mm. all the water diversions, has really led to a sort shortage near extinction, extinction in some watersheds of the coho salmon. Can you elaborate on that kind of counterintuitive thing that you said about, you know, it's better to buy wild caught salmon and rather than farm raised salmon? So a lot of the farm raised salmon, and I haven't followed up on this in the last couple of years. So if someone wants to correct me, I'm way into it. But farm raised salmon, their meat has died, first of all. So it could be pink, but there's so many of them concentrated in small areas. And usually at the mouth of rivers where adults are gathering and waiting for the rains to come so they can make their way up into their natal streams because salmon are anadromous. So they start in the fresh water, they go out to the salt water, live three or four years, and they come back and spawn and then die in the fresh water. It's really, really interesting cycle. And the indigenous people have great stories around how to explain that to their kids or to themselves. It's super interesting. But when you have a gathering you know, a not unnatural gathering of salmon doing their almost their whole life cycle in the river. And then you have the native ones, the wild ones going past this, they're catching those diseases, those sea lice mm -hmm. and those other diseases, and it's killing them. And so we don't want to support farm raised salmon. We don't want farm raised salmon to happen. Mm -hmm. We want to fix our streams, when to restore our streams, because we don't need to have pens of salmon. We need to have streams full of salmon. Mm -hmm. That are pink from sense. the food that they eat. That are pink from the food they eat, not from dye. Good mm -hmm. Lord. So we had salmon. That was number three. Michael, what you got for us for number two? For number two, I'm going to tie back into your Valley Oak story a Ooh. little bit here. And I, I also maybe gave a little bit of a preview as to what this species is. So these are large and gregarious species, many different kinds across the world. I think with the exception of Australia and Antarctica, and it's woodpeckers. Woodpeckers are very often, as, as kids, one of the first birds that we notice because they are maybe colorful and gregarious, and maybe they were even pounding away on the side of your house at some point, <laughs> and you're like, what's going on out there? In particular, I want to talk about the acorn woodpecker, which is found in many parts of the Western U.S., and I think that the name actually gives a little bit of a tip off as to how they relate to valley oaks, because as an acorn woodpecker, well, obviously they must like acorns, right? And they do, but like so many common names, there's another layer to the story. So acorn woodpeckers, they live in these communal groups, you know, family groups very often, and they will go out and they collect acorns and they store them in specially drilled holes that they make where they just will, will make the hole just big enough and then wedge that acorn in there. And you can have thousands of acorns stored together in, a, in holes on a tree or on a power pole. A wooden power pole is one of their favorite places, actually. Mm -hmm. and, and each of these little holes will have acorns, like every few inches, scattered across. And that's called a granary. And I'm going to go off on the granaries here for a little, little bit and then come back to why acorns are not where the story ends for these birds. But the granaries are really interesting because if you put a fresh acorn in a hole and you put it in there really tight because you don't want somebody else to come along and steal your acorn, right? So, so you're a special bird. You're this really metal bird that you can bang your head against solid wood at forces that, you know, we can barely even fathom. But you can really wedge that thing in there. 
but that fresh acorn is going to dry out at some point. Mm -hmm. Or maybe there's an insect inside that acorn and it eats it and it shrivels up a little mm -hmm. bit and it gets loose. So there are you know, specific birds in these communal groups that manage the granary and they go around mm -hmm. patrolling, looking for loose acorns and they'll take it out and find a better fitting hole and continually move these acorns around and sometimes discarding the old, you know, the really old ones. Now you might be wondering, well, why are they storing all these acorns and not eating them? You know, why, why are they, mm -hmm. why are they letting them dry out in the first place? And that's because like almost every woodpecker, they prefer insects. So mm -hmm. despite their name, any chance they get, they would rather eat an insect. It doesn't matter at what time of year it is. If there's an insect available, they're going to go for the insect. And in fact, acorn woodpeckers can fly catch. So like, there's this whole category of birds called flycatchers that, you know, maybe if you're lucky, you get to observe one sometime and it will sit on a perch and it will look for a bug flying by of some sort and it will sally out and grab that bug in midair and come back and, and eat it. Well, acorn woodpeckers will do the same thing if the opportunity arises. So as the day warms up, if you have a chance to look at acorn woodpeckers, you'll see them fly catching. Now, on top of that, they will also mimic, well, Mimic is too strong of a word, but but they'll use similar strategies to what a sapsucker will use. Whereas, you know, sapsuckers, another type of woodpecker, will go and drill these little holes and let the sap leak out. And then insects get caught in that sap and they'll come back and, and they'll eat those insects. Acorn woodpeckers will do the same thing. Sometimes their own, you know, sap, sometimes they're taking advantage of other sap as well. So it's really cool. And acorns are just kind of a backup plan for them. Mm. So these are the planners of the woodpecker world where they have this large store of backup food just in case they need it, which by the way, sometimes attract insects too. So they can look like they're eating the acorn, but they're really going for that insect. So some people are probably wondering why the acorn woodpeckers want their acorns to be so tight in those trees. Yeah. Like why, like, they, why don't like, they like loose ones? Yeah. Like, so when I was talking about other animals stealing the acorns and that's why they want it to be so tight, like I've seen this actually happen, in fact, where an acorn woodpecker had some fresh acorns and it was going to put it in the granary and it starts to tap it in. And then suddenly like a raven or a crow hey. will come in and scare away the woodpecker and Drama. it's able to steal that acorn and have it for itself. And squirrels would want to do the same thing. Yeah. So there are many other animals watching these acorn woodpeckers. And if those acorn woodpeckers can't get those acorns tightly fit, it's an easy meal for some other animal. So. Yeah, speaking of drama, that's some of the that's some of my favorite bird watching is acorn woodpeckers at the granary. That's some good drama because they'll chase off anything. They are brave up there. I love it. They are. So now how can you help? Well, listen to Michelle and plant some valley oaks, protect those valley oaks. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't live in California and you don't have valley oaks, really, you know, oak trees are great for all woodpeckers. Part of it is because most woodpeckers are cavity nesters. They need holes in big, old, mature trees. And oak trees, very often when they get mature, they lose a limb, a hole develops. Maybe there's some carpenter ants that help along or you know something like that. Woodpeckers don't always excavate their own holes. Sometimes they use naturally occurring holes, but other times they will excavate their own. So big, old trees, keep those around. Support those insects like we've talked about in a couple different ways because most woodpeckers will eat insects you know, as their primary source. And the other thing is, if you have a big old tree that has cavities in it, don't just cut it down, as long as it's not a safety concern. You know, if mm -hmm. it's a safety concern, you know, that's, that's another Cut story. it to height. Cut it to height if it's a safety concern. Cut it concern. to height. Exactly. So if you can leave a good chunk of that trunk, like up to where there are some holes, you're doing a couple of things. You're leaving those cavities, but then you're also supporting the habitat because dead trees, trunks, things like that, our habitat for many other organisms, not just birds. So it's very overlooked. We want clean, pristine parks and lawns, and it's so tempting just to go remove these things. But lots of cool stuff happens on, you know, on these dead and dying trees if you can keep them. I just moved into a new place, and I'm talking my housemates or whatever they're called, <laughs> neighbors, <laughs> um, into creating a snag out of a Bradford pear. Yeah. And so, because I'm going to girdle it. And then we're going to cut it to height. And then there are artist types. So I said, it'd be great if you guys could do some art on it and drill some holes in it and some cool patterns for the native bees. And that was the deal. That was how I sold it. Nice. Was do art on it. So we're going to have this snag that's going to have tons of art on it. We won't get acorn woodpeckers here because it's too close to the coast, but we will get some coolness and I can't wait to see it. So 
if people aren't into having snags in their yards or sanding dead trees, you can cut them to height so they don't fall in a house or fall on anybody. And then you can make art on them. And that might be a way to get standing dead trees more welcomed into our spaces. That's what a great, a great idea. idea. I love it. I love it. And speaking people's language too. I love that you didn't just be like, you know, you you specifically knew you were talking to artists. So you're like, hey, yeah. let's do art here. So tailoring your message or finding out about people before tailoring your message to them so that, you know, you actually that's speak how I got to what them, they like. That's how I got them on board. Is I was like, what, mm-hmm. what pattern should we plant these? yellow flowering tidy tips in and they're like oh we know they didn't give a crap about gardening before (laughs) but once they got to do their expression all of a sudden Mm -hmm. they got interested they painted pots all kinds of stuff brilliant that's awesome and you know connecting in that way is is great i i wanted to go back real quick to cavity nesters because cavity nesting birds like many 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 birds most birds are in decline with a few Mm -hmm. exceptions but the cavity nesting birds are very often doing worse than Mm -hmm. than many other birds because we have so few old growth trees and when they do get old and they start to look like they might be a uh, a safety risk they get cut down to the ground even in parks you know because it's a liability for them so i I can't really stress this enough it's one of those you know hiding in plain sight conservation issues that we have also to me it's like whoever goes and takes a picture of just like a very normy looking tree you know what i mean it's like it's beautiful when a tree has character i want to go and take a picture of a a crazy like gnarled old tree with holes in it and stuff like that's more interesting to look at and has more character and i think that it it lends some of that to the adjacent kind of surroundings and what's better than getting a picture of a baby bird sticking its little head out of right. a hole in the side of that's a tree? the best that's the best okay for our number one we got to be ready let me go grab my hat oh okay i have this hat and i have some slips of paper in here get some of those noises on the mic and on the strips of paper i've written different sports okay i don't know a whole lot about sports and that's okay good we're in kind of good company (laughs) but i know the general idea of how these sports are played and so there were three of us we each had three favorite species and that means that we had a list of nine but we need a list of ten so to figure out whose top pick gets to be number one on the list we need a way to figure that out so what we're gonna do is i'm gonna draw out one of these sports and read what the sport is and then we're gonna each make a case for which of our species would win against the others why would our species be good at that sport all right does everyone understand the rules is that good and we're gonna reveal the name and then tell why it would be the best yes exactly okay Okay, so the sport is... Okay, somebody say when. When. Go. Okay, soccer. All right, so who wants to go first? Who's going to win at soccer? My species will lose because it's stuck in the ground. Me. <laughs> but if you kick a ball ball at it, it might ricochet back into the goalpost. <laughs> That's the only way that we would score. What's your species? Coast Redwood. Of course it is. You're being on brand today, too. All right, Coast Redwood. I love it. Well, I mean, I I think, though, that they're pretty wide, so they could make a great goalie. And their roots are really shallow. There you go. So if they got some X-Men powers, it would be easy for them to unbury their roots and kick things in. You know, well, I have a question. In. How long is this game? If we're talking about like a multi-thousand year game. They're uh, going the to outlast. Gonna, oh, yeah. 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 That's true. Honestly, change the yeah. terms a little bit. Right? We got to yeah, be on totally. plant time. It takes 2,000 all- years. Yeah. yeah. Humans are too hasty. Okay. Yeah. Well, in that case, we got it. Yeah. Coast Redwood's great. <laughs> awesome. Michael, what's Unless yours? has got a bristlecone pine. Yes. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Outlast everybody. <laughs> All right. Well, my species is a bristlecone pine. Oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Filed. No, no. So my species, I've already talked about a little bit today. It's aphids. Oh. And I think aphids would win this without a doubt because they can reproduce so fast. They're mm. just going to win in numbers. Strength and numbers. You know, the, the reason they can reproduce so fast is because they give live birth. I don't want to get into my whole aphid story mm-hmm. here. But but yeah, I think I think aphids, they're super diverse. They're born pregnant even. Yeah. What? So <laughs> they I was will... sorry, you just blew my mind. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've been pregnant and I was not good at playing soccer when I was pregnant. So I will just go ahead and put that out there. Mm. All right. So mine is the yellow-billed magpie. Another endemic species. It's a California endemic bird. 
and it's got this striking yellow bird. It's a corvid, and it's got this long, beautiful tail. It's got these white wingtips. They're just very distinctive, very easy, even for somebody like me who doesn't know anything about birds to identify. I can spot these birds. There's a certain neighborhood in Sacramento. Every time I go there, I'm like, oh, I'm in Arden now. There's yellow-billed magpies. Like, they always greet me every single time that I go in there. And I think they would win at soccer because they're incredibly smart and cooperative. And so they have these, like, groups, right? Like, they are able to communicate with, like, different squawks and things. So they are able to communicate with their groups. They're cooperative. Like, the parents raise the babies together. And sometimes even, like, the older sibling will come and help raise the baby. And they're corvids. They're super smart. They're like one of the smartest birds that's out there. So I think they would have the strategy down. So I think that's why the yellow-billed magpies would win. The aphids would just fly into their eyes. Oh. <laughs> the, but the, the redwood would the, fall and crush everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but the magpies are up. They'll eat whatever's available. So they're just they're going to take out the aphids. They're uh, just going to gobble I, them up. Reproduction rate. I think, uh, I think the aphids got it. All right. All right. What do we think? So out of these three... This is the part that I didn't actually think through. How do we decide after we make the case <laughs> which one of these actually works? I should have picked the dung beetle. Is Oh, is... that would have been perfect for yeah. this. You know what, though? Maybe the, the Coast Redwood wins for goalie, for sure. And the, you know, the ma- yellow-billed magpie is a great, like, coach be able, because it's going to be able to tell those aphids where to go. And the aphids could be the actual players. Although I don't know if they could move the ball, so that's kind of a problem. So if enough of them got ball. on one side, they could use <laughs> they could like, gravity. Or something. All right. So do we have to draw these out of a hat? Like, how do we decide which one is the winner? I don't think the aphids would win. If I was being honest, I think I think probably the the magpies would win if you could mm-hmm. teach them what to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So should we have yellow-billed magpies be the winners? I think so. Yeah. All right. Yellow-billed magpies are the winner. So we'll put them in our number one spot and. These are really interesting birds because they're mostly in the Central Valley of California. They're super bright, like I said before. And so they eat just about everything, which can be good and bad because they can eat rodents, which can have problems with uh, rodenticide ending up in the yellow-billed magpies. They eat insects, which can end up having problems with neonicotinoids ending up in the yellow-billed magpies. So there's some issues that they face because of their diverse diet. But one of the other really big issues that they face is West Nile virus. So in the early 2000s, I want to say like 2003, 4, 5, somewhere in there, West Nile virus hit the scene in California and it massively just decimated the population of yellow-billed magpies. And that population has never fully recovered. And there's even kind of a question of can this species build a resistance even once they survive it? Like, are they even building a resistance to West Nile or can they just get reinfected and die because they haven't totally re- recovered from that. And these are super charismatic birds. I love watching them. They are absolutely my favorite bird species. I and they can even learn to talk. Can they? Yeah. Now, I had a friend who, back in the 80s, whose mom brought home a baby that fell out of a nest. Uh-huh. And they kept it. And it could learn how to talk. And it could talk on cue. So when you walked in the door, it would say, hello. And when you were getting your key, when the, his mom was getting the keys ready, it would go, goodbye. Like, I had, like... It took cues, but it could speak a lot of words. Oh my gosh. So it would sit there in the soccer game and be like, go. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so West Nile is a huge issue. I don't know how much we can do to help with the West Nile issue. So the thing that I said should help this species is not using neonicotinoids, which is a whole class of pesticides, which are systemic in plants. So they can be applied to roots or they can be applied to the leaves of plants. They're taken up into all the tissues of the plant, including the nectar including the nectar. Exactly. And so whatever comes along and feeds on that plant, maybe it's a bee going to pollinate it. Maybe it's a caterpillar going to munch on some leaves that gets taken up into that animal. And then that gets eaten by a bird or whatever the case may be. And it can, it can move through these different layers or different levels of the the food web. So it can affect a lot of different species. So, and they stick around a long time, those, those neonics. And they can get washed into watersheds. So like when it rains, they get washed into the water and they can, end up in a lot of our waterways too. So yeah, they're real hard to get rid of. They stick around and they kind of just spread all over the place. So they can be real ugly, real nasty stuff. So any way that you can avoid using them, I know that some of them are going to be banned in California for consumers to purchase at some point, but I'm pretty sure that like farms and stuff can still use them. And so if there's ever anything up for a vote and you want to reach out to your representatives to let them know like, hey, vote for this this bill, try to get them banned. That would be a really great move too. 
All right, we got our we got our list, guys. I'm proud of us. Thank you guys for humoring me and talking about your favorite California species with me. This was a lot of fun. Thanks for sticking through the entire episode. If you made it this far, I hope that it means that you enjoyed it. If so, please spread the word and share this episode with three friends or groups that you think would enjoy it too. As for today's episode, let me know. Did I miss anything? Was there a topic I should have covered? Let me know at podcast at jumpstartnature.com or DM me on any of my social accounts. I'll do my best to answer your questions. You can find me at Nature's Archive, one word, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I also share photography, nature stories, and much more on those accounts, so you can follow just to stay in touch, too. And despite being called crazy by numerous friends and colleagues, last year I left my tech career behind to start Jumpstart Nature, which Nature's Archive is now part of. For the sake of myself, my family, and the planet, I need to make this work. So please also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash jumpstartnature. I offer some exclusive content and perks, and you can start donations as low as $4 a month. Lastly, please also check out our latest creation. It's the Jumpstart Nature podcast. We just completed our pilot season, where each episode reveals an unseen, surprising, or misunderstood nature topic with the help of experts and our host, Griff Griffith. It's entertaining and inspiring, and even reached number three on the Apple Nature podcast charts. There's much more on our roadmap, but we need your support. So check out jumpstartnature.com for more details. Thank you. Thank you.